Your next vehicle from Community Motors of Mason City. Great service from three locations. Community and Monroe, Community Motors Westside, and Mason City Ford. Ten new franchises and hundreds of vehicles to give you more choices. Plus, Community offers an exclusive 3-3 warranty on pre-owned vehicles and 10-year, 250,000-mile warranty on new. Need more reasons why? Stop or visit communityautogroup.com. Because nobody beats a community deal. Now, we're going to get started here just a minute or two. to see such a great crowd here today. Uh, I, was, I was asked to, yes. I was asked to let everyone know that the restrooms are just out the hall and around the corner to the left, so... And all the nuns found that yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are in our second, on our second stop of a three-stop statewide tour, one-day uh, sort of marathon, <laughs> quick in-and-out uh, stops here. Um, but we're just thrilled that uh, Sister Simone Campbell is with us from Network Lobby. Um, they actually kicked off their original Nuns on the Bus tour this summer in Iowa, and so we're just very excited to have them back. Um, they are going to, uh, she's going to talk a lot about the the Ryan budget and the impact on those living in poverty uh, here in Iowa and, and across the country. Um, but first, uh, she's going to be introduced by Sister Jeannie Hagedorn um, from uh, Davenport. No, no. Don't no, Sorry. <laughs> By the end of the day, we'll get this right, all right? Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> the Sisters of Humility. And she has been just, uh, she and Sister uh, Elaine have been just absolutely tremendous in helping set this up uh, as well. So I'll turn it over to, to Sister Jean to introduce Sister Simone. Mm -hmm. And he can be excused because our mother house is in Davenport. There you go. <laughs> and actually, I don't think Sister Simone needs much introduction to any of you here. Um, she is, as you know, one of the nuns on the bus who has made her way through our country trying to be a voice for the voiceless. There are so many times that the, the needy and the poor in our country are being marginalized and she has been a terrific advocate for those people for all of us she comes with a deep faith all of that requires when she speaks to the democratic national convention <laughs> to people in congress state legislators even the president <laughs> so we are just thrilled that she is joining us today to bring that reminder to us that we have to stand in solidarity with one another. The gospel calls us to live in solidarity with one another. And I would like to um, share with you, if I could, just a short email that I received last night from Lee and Joey, who are here with us today. They sent this email. Dear sisters, we would like to be included in your Thursday activities, all of them, if you have room for us. My husband has multiple sclerosis, and your mission is important to him and a great many others. We are inspired by your living testament of faith and action and would like to be part of it. This is the kind of hope that Simone and all of us want to share with the suffering people of our country. It is All Saints Day. We came close to canonizing her in Des Moines. <laughs> I'd have to have died first. <laughs> and as a Sister of Humility, I have to say with my sister Elaine, we are very, very proud to be able to call Simone a dear friend. Well, I have to say, 
say that it is such a treat and a treasure to be back in Iowa. Um, the, we were on the bus for two weeks this summer. June 17th, we started in Des Moines and went up to Ames and then went to Cedar Rapids and on to Dubuque. And the landscape looked a little different then. Uh, but it was the beginning of the really hard summer with the drought and everybody was worried about the corn and what was going to happen. And now I, I come through here and the fields are plowed and everybody's still a little worried about what's going to happen. And um, I think with the election looming on Tuesday, it has all of our attention on the future of our nation. And we're here not with a partisan message, but rather with a message about being we the people. We the people together to engage democracy. And what some of the politicians would prefer is if we're more like couch potatoes. If they can you know, get us to wear their button, and if we can sit on the couch and watch the returns and root for our favorite candidate, but forget about them on November 7th. And so what our message is, you've got to vote. There's early voting right outside. That was exciting <laughs> to see some people doing it. I, I was just really excited. But the other exciting piece is November 7th is just as important as November 6th. Because it's about we, the people, coming together to make tough decisions and to hold our elected officials accountable, whoever is elected. We have to be that nudge of engaging democracy. Because as our Constitution says, it's overhanging on the wall over there, it's we the people of the United States that form the more perfect union. So we took to the bus in June, and we're on the bus now, to lift up the fact that the Ryan budget, which we've been lobbying against for two years, was not the good way forward for our country. And then Governor Romney chose Congressman Ryan as his running mate, and that sort of catapulted our message into this more partisan sphere that we're not, it's not the place we would choose to be. But the fact is, it's an opportunity to lift up what the alternatives are. Now, a few things about the Ryan budget, just so you know. The Ryan budget wants to cut $15 million out of Iowa's Head Start program. It's the best program for young kids from low-income families. They want to decimate it. That would eliminate over 2,000 slots for kids. It's dance music, I can tell you. <laughs> um, it also wants to cut $31 million out of special ed. Special ed for kids with learning disabilities that are struggling to, to come to a point in their lives where they can participate fully, get jobs, make it in our economy. It wants to cut Medicaid so that 329,000, 329,000 more Iowans and seniors and children receive health care. This is a good way forward, I don't think so. It wants to do away with the health insurance credit for small businesses and their employers that are in the Affordable Care Act. I run a small business in D.C. and we pay for our health insurance for our employees. We pay $560 a month per employee. It's a lot of money. But the small business credit that we got, we got $9,000 back. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a lot, but it helped us be able to afford health care for our, for our employees. It wants to cut prescription drugs, it wants to, and this is the one that makes me most nuts. It wants to cut SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Food Program. Now, food program goes, it, it wants to cut 34.3 million meals for low-income Iowans. 34.3 million meals. Well, now you think, well, Maybe you could, they could, what if they ate just every other day or something like that? I mean, it doesn't work. But what I discovered, when we left Iowa, we headed up to Janesville in, on the bus this summer and then on to Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee, I met Billy and his wife and two kids. And Billy's working. His wife's working. But they're still at making not enough to get them out of poverty. So they qualify for food stamps. And what I realized is the food stamps didn't give them enough to keep food on the table and a roof over their head. So they chose to keep a roof over their schools, over their kids' heads. So that Billy told me so his kids could stay in the same school. That was a great responsible choice for parents to do. And the way they're getting by is with food stamps for breakfast and lunch, and then going to St. Benedict's dining room every evening for dinner. 
Can you imagine? He says, as Billy told me, it wasn't the best thing, but at least his kids were getting nutrition. And you can see his 14-year-old son was at that age where he was just eating everything in sight. His dad had left a half a roll on his ta on his plate, and the son reached over and kind of just took it. And you know, Billy kind of smiled at it. Well, what do you do with a 14-year-old? I mean, really. So, but what I realized was, in that setting, is that it wasn't just a hand out to Billy. What it was was a benefit to the employer that the employer was paying low wages and that his employee could eat because of the dining room and because of food stamps. So the employer was benefiting. And then I had to face the fact that I was benefiting as a consumer because it was keeping costs down for me. And so I was benefiting from Billy being able to use food stamps and being able to eat at the dining room. We're all in this together. This is not about a hand out. It's about how we share the wealth of our nation. And we've got to see that we're interconnected in this process. I know that in Iowa, I've heard stories so far just in this morning about growing hunger. It seems so sad in an agricultural economy that kids are going hungry, but it's true. Wages are low, it's true. Wages haven't risen for almost basically, they've been basically flat for the last 25 years but costs keep going up. So how do we, the people, come together and take care of our families? It's not the Ryan budget. Because the Ryan budget, Congressman Ryan says he has to do it because you know it's the only way forward, and it's all because of the deficit. We have to be responsible for our financial house. We have to get our financial house in order. But in the richest nation on earth, we're not exactly bankrupt. What we're bankrupt in is political will to fix it. In the year 2000, most of us in this room are old enough to, to remember that, it, remember the 2000 election? Seems like it was yesterday. And what were we arguing over? We were arguing over what do we do with the surplus in our federal budget. Remember that argument? And we decided, the nation decided, the nation voted, and we decided on a tax cut. The tax cut that trickled down to most everybody gave the signif most significant money to people at the top. And if you give most significant money to the people at the top, the theory was they were going to create jobs. <laughs> Just saying, now we haven't seen the jobs, have we? The fact is, what it did was increased wealth and increase offshoring of investment, wealth and investment. So, Congressman Ryan says the way to grow the economy is you cut all these social service programs, you give greater tax cuts to the wealthy at the top, and then <coughs> Allegedly, we'll have jobs. I say, you know, the definition, old definition of insanity is when you keep doing the same thing over and over, but you expect a different result. <laughs> so we have an alternative. I love this part. We have a faithful budget. The Christian, Jewish, and Muslim community, advocacy community in D.C. came together. We argued. You should see faith people fight because we try to be nice, but you know we're fighting. <laughs> <laughs> we had big fights. <laughs> We had people walk away from the table, and then you had to go and invite them back. We really didn't mean to say those kind of things. Please, <laughs> well, we did mean to say it, but we'll work it out. <laughs> and what happened was, now the faithful budget is 55 glorious pages, and we have some charts and graphs and things, and you can find it at faithfulbudget.org. But it comes down to five basic words, and it's this. Reasonable revenue for responsible programs. No politician's going to tell you four days before election that they're going to raise taxes, but let me tell you, there's no other way. We can cut all we want, but we're not going to deal with our financial house by cutting, by just cutting programs, especially safety net programs, which did not create the problem. What created the problem were the tax cuts we've already talked about, waging two wars, which just breaks my heart. We waged two <coughs> wars and asked our men and women in uniform to put themselves in harm's way and we didn't pay to protect them. We did not raise a single dime to pay for those wars. That was wrong. And we've got to pay now. The Bush administration dealt with it by never putting it into the regular budget. They always acted surprised every year, like, oh, we're at war, we have to pay for it. And no one would vote against paying for our military men and women. But it was irresponsible budgeting. We got away with the fantasy that the budget was better than it was because we didn't pay for it. Now we have to pay for them. But 
We can do it. We can have the political will. <coughs> Some small changes can make a big difference. The fact that the people who have benefited the most could pay a little bit more without hurting. We could do that. We need responsible programs. All the social service programs we saw were immensely responsible, meaning that they were accountable. They take federal money, and what most people don't know is that a bunch of the programs nuns run take a bit of federal money, put it together with foundation money, put it together with donations and volunteers and good looks and God knows what <laughs> else, <laughs> prayers, duct tape, and the Holy Spirit, and we create these amazing, amazing programs to serve people at the margins of our society. But the money is the key to making, the federal money is the key to making sure that these programs work.